I've got uh, somebody, someone with, uh, someone with me here who's uh, had uh, some global experience in managing funds and uh, now who's uh, a lot more India focused. Shiv Puri is managing director uh, with the TVF Capital Advisors. Uh, he's based out of Singapore, uh, runs a fund. Uh, and uh, is looking at India very, very keenly. Shiv, uh, good to have you here. Good morning. Good Thanks morning. very nice much. Nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, based out of Singapore, what is your perception about uh, what's happening to the market here? Because things definitely changed uh, a whole lot after the election results. Uh, and, uh, you know, the market now, according to many, is in a structural bullish phase. Uh, how do you see things, Shiv? Let's start with a, let me get your first impressions on that. I would uh, generally agree with that uh, view that uh, there has been, uh, I'd say, a big structural change in terms of politics that happened in May this year, and a small change in terms of a massive uh, drop in oil prices that's happened over the last few months. Uh, you know, if you see the market this year is up uh, about 30 odd percent, uh, half of which happened even prior to the election, mm. and the other half uh, post, post the elections. Uh, earnings growth have been in the, in the low teens. Um, so there has been some multiple expansion, uh, you know, from the 12, 13 that we started at, uh, at the beginning of the year to the mid-15 mid 15, 15 range. Um, you know, va valuations are reasonable. Uh, and uh, I think uh, one of the interesting things that is, that is happening right now is this massive drop in the price of oil, uh, 40 or $50 per barrel, um, is potentially a 20 or 30, 25 or $30 billion saving uh, for India. Uh, and the benefits are, are quite immense. I mean, whether it's the current account deficit or in helping uh, with the inflation numbers uh, or is it in lowering the logistics and operating costs for companies and therefore having better corporate margins, um, it's obviously a help for consumers. Um, so, you know, the all-around benefits of this may be a little lost uh, uh, in terms of the magnitude that India benefits and uh, in terms of the volatility that we're seeing uh, in, in the markets uh, right now. But I think the benefits of this in 2015 uh, will, will play out. Uh, the other important thing is that uh, corporate earnings uh, today, you know, if you look at operating margins, uh, they're about uh, 25 to 30 percent below their long-term average. And this is very typical of uh, margins at the start of a cycle, uh, where you're coming in from a period of high inflation and high in interest rates and low growth, um, that the operating margins are, are lower than the average. So you're going to see, I think, next year, uh, operating leverage in uh, corporate India. Uh, you probably see corporate profits pick up over the next few years from roughly 4.5% of GDP today to, to north of 6, which again is the long-term average. And in, in, a, with, in a good sort of top-line environment uh, with operating leverage, uh, I think earnings growth over the next few years look pretty good. So I think the all, all overall picture is, uh, is fairly positive. Um, and uh, I think the, this recent decline in the price of oil is uh, only going to help this operating leverage story play out. Okay, so you mentioned two things. I'll get to very interesting points you're making, so we want to sort of dig into each one of those. But the broad thrust that which you began with was the government, uh, new government, and of course the drop in oil prices. Drop in oil prices, of course, happens, happens. It impacts uh, different sort of, you know, uh, players in the system in different ways, broadly positive. But the government change, right, and the promise uh, uh, with which it came into power, you think it's lived up to that promise? I think, uh, you know, uh, we have to be still more patient. Uh, they are working on a number of different things. And uh, they've been in power for seven months. Uh, I think because of, you know, uh, what has happened in, in the country in terms of policy over the last four or five years, perhaps, you know, we're looking for things to happen quickly. Uh, but, but I think it's, it's going to take time. And, you know, they're working on, I think, the right things. For example, the GST bill is humongously important for this country. Um, you know, insurance is, is a good way of opening up the sector and bringing foreign, foreign capital flows into it. Um, but they are working on the substantial stuff as well, which is, you know, the land acquisition uh, uh, rules, uh, labor reform. So I think all of this stuff is happening, but it's, it's going to happen at a slightly slower pace. I feel that right now there is enough low-hanging fruit in the country to get GDP growth back up to the mid-5% range mm. from where we are in the mid-4% uh, range where we were a couple of quarters ago, to the mid-5 to 6% range. And uh, so, so they do have some more time uh, in, in terms of getting this. But at the same time, they need to get, they need to get going. And now we, of course, reading that there, some of these things are going to get done through ordinances and, and things like that. Mm. Um, but, but, I, but I think overall, they're, they're, working, they're working at it. And we hope that uh, some of this gets translated into action pretty soon. 
Shiv, do you think uh, 2015, we're going to see a marked shift from the focus being very squarely on low fiscal deficit uh, to actually the government spending? Because uh, demand is an issue. I mean, you know, two weeks back, the chief economic advisor, Arvind Subramaniam, uh, uh, at a press conference actually made it quite clear. He said the private sector isn't investing and we'll have to actually be open, uh, we'll have to be open to the idea that the government actually spends in uh, a variety of sectors. Uh, and now that's the first that I heard somebody that senior in the government actually openly talking about that. Is the government going, to, is the uh, market, the financial market going to be okay with that government uh, spending? Because it, it has not been. Uh, and it's wanted the fiscal deficit to be constrained. It's uh, well under control. Uh, but with demand being extremely low and the private sector not investing, uh, the last resort uh, sort of is with the government. I think you're right. I think the government will, will have to start spending specifically on the infrastructure sector uh, to get the ball rolling on that front. Um, and I think if they are going to, going to do it within the constraints of the fiscal deficit that they have, uh, this would be the ideal time because they do have a environment where the, the, because of lower oil prices, uh, you have some sort of fla financial flexibility to, to go and, and, and spend. Uh, it could lead to a kickstart of the infrastructure cycle starting again, uh, which, which again is a positive for all aspects of the economy. But I, but I think they will keep an eye on the fiscal deficit and it's not something that they're going to uh, be very comfortable in, in uh, letting go out of uh, uh, control. But, right, but certainly I think I it's an area that, that they will This is already they will from the Delhi on. studio. You know, when you were saying that the, there's some leeway for uh, government spending, uh, one of the estimates made by the government itself is that they will fall short by about 1 lakh crore in terms of direct tax and indirect tax uh, revenues. And um, of course the oil bill, oil import bill and the subsidy bill is go has, would have gone down. But effectively it's not that easy to meet that 4.1% target that the government has. If it doesn't meet it, then what happens internationally, globally? Well, I think we shouldn't be very fixated on just a 4.1% number. Whether it's at 4.1 or 3.7 or 4.7, 4 uh, I'm sure the government wants Mr. to Puri, draw the you line. Know, but I uh, think you, uh, the three of us here might not want to be fixated, but you have experience of what happens uh, with global rating agencies. You've worked with global funds. We uh, just want to tap into your experience there. When the government says that, okay, we are going to be hitting that 4.1 percent. Mr. Chidambaram actually achieved his targets in the last two uh, years of his, uh, you know, of uh, the UPA2 rule. If the government this time does not achieve it, what happens? What do the SNPs and the Fitches start doing? I think you have to look at it in the overall macroeconomic context hmm. of what, what, when the target is set and when it, when it is to be achieved. For example, about a year ago, uh, we had a problem with the, with the currency. Our currency was, had, moved, had depreciated quite dramatically. Hmm. Um, there was less confidence from global investors regarding policy. Uh, there, was, there, was, there was policies that were, that were, that were flip-flopping. Okay. Um, as a result, the macro backdrop of India wasn't very strong. Hmm. And so therefore, people are trying to focus on the exact hardline numbers uh, as that's the only thing they had. Hmm. Today, I think the environment's a lot different. Mm. Uh, I think people are looking at India in, in a very different light, and therefore the government has a little bit of leeway if it is actually using the fiscal uh, deficit uh, mm. for the right reasons. So in a, in a sense that if it goes to 4.5, because Mr. Arvind Subramaniam pointed out that government should, uh, one should start looking at public investment again. So let's say fiscal deficit at 4.5, the credit rating agencies would not really be worried about that right now? Well, I, I think there should be significantly less worried because mm. the last time that it happened, GDP growth was going from 6.5% to 4%. Mm. Today, it's gone from 45 already to 5 and likely to pick up from here. So mm. I think in a rising GDP environment, to have a slightly uh, higher fiscal deficit is perfectly okay. And 13. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying is that the environment, even at that time, was almost like that it's round the corner. Some of those reforms which were being talked about appeared to be round the corner. The same seems to be the story right now, because if you look at GST itself, as a corporate, I mean, if you were a corporate, would you be happy with this kind of GST where, where the average tax is now likely to be about 27%? 
Uh, unlikely, unlikely so. Uh, I think that uh, you know, getting something like GST done in this country is not going to be an easy matter. So if it has to go on for a little while, it's, it's almost expected. It's probably the single largest tax reform that will happen uh, in this country for a very long time. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm not saying it's, 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 it's uh, probably going to come out perfect from the first, first time, but I think it'll be a major achievement if this government is, is, able, to, uh, is able to get it done. On, on the reforms part that you're, that you're asking, yeah, it's clear that there, there haven't been anything significant that is already done. But having said that, you know, you've seen, other than the reforms, the business cycles turned over the last couple of quarters. Uh, you are seeing, uh, you know, whether it's in financial services or in, or in auto uh, volumes, uh, credit growth, you know, some of those things have picked up. And I think over the last uh, six months, that's getting reflected in the, in the GDP growth numbers. Uh, Shiv, do you think, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, fact that the government is actually taking all the, the ordinance route, right, uh, to do a lot of these things, coal, for example, insurance, land acquisition, arbitration, uh, and the fact that it still has uh, trouble in the Rajya Sabha, it doesn't, it doesn't have the numbers in the Rajya Sabha. And uh, the point is a lot of these ordinances will lapse unless they are passed within six weeks of the next parliament session beginning. Uh, it's happened before with the insurance uh, uh, sort of ordinance which happened. Uh, is, 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 uh, so it seems the intent is there, the government wants to do a lot of these things. Uh, but it might just well, uh, it, uh, you know, it, it may not have the numbers to actually push a lot of these things through. Uh, how do you read that? You think the market is going to be uh, okay waiting till they have the government has the numbers in Rajya Sabha? That might well only happen sometime in 2017-18. Yeah, I think the, the, the Rajya Sabha numbers are supposed to be 2016 or 17. But mm. no, I, I think that uh, it's going to be interesting to see how these things uh, play out. There are a couple of events that are happening at the first quarter of uh, next year, the budget of course in February of next year, mm. um, as well as uh, the outcome of how some of these uh, ordinances actually get uh, passed uh, into into law. Um, I think time will tell. It's really hard to to figure out right now whether some of these things are going to happen. It's obviously politics is play and mm. at play, and and that takes a little time to play out for the market. You know, Onan asked you whether uh, the rating agencies etc are going to be uh, happy if 4.1 wasn't met. You said, well, is the whole set, the whole picture, and look, it, that looks a lot better than what it was looking like in 2012 and 13. Let me actually ask you the opposite question: If the government in the pursuit of that 4.1% number were to cut spending. You know, just about six weeks back, eight weeks back, till about that time, a lot of economists who came on the show said, uh, you know, the government is going to cut spending by about 80, 90 or 1,000 crores or so. If they were to cut spending now, uh, how would the market take that? Uh, I, would, I would not see any reason why this is the time for them to be cut, cutting spending. I mean, wasteful spending is something else. Uh, unproductive spending is something else. But if they're looking to kickstart the economy and kickstart the infrastructure sector, uh, anyway, the investment level there is incredibly low. Uh, you know, so I, I think that's an area where they're going to uh, increase uh, spending uh, you know, probably in the years to come. Okay, Mr. Puli, we have to take a very quick break. We're, you know, once we come back, we want to focus a little bit on a few things in the economy. One is effective demand, the kind of leverage that there is in the system, and capacity utilizations, and how that is going to affect any uh, kind of revival. That's right after this two-minute break. Stay with us. conversation with Shiv Puri, MD, TVF Capital Advisors. Thank you for staying with us, Mr. Puri. You know, before the break, I was saying that I would like to focus a little bit on two or three things. One is leverage, capacity utilization, the second one, and the kind of money that uh, is available to invest right now. So let's start off with leverage. You know, today in the Mint, there's a quick edit based on the RBI's latest report, which it released yesterday, the Financial st Stability Report, and it says that about one-third of all bad assets that banks have in India are exposure to the infrastructure sector. And the RBI says that uh, that's just on the books. The exposure to infrastructure sector could actually be as bad as four times what it looks like on the books because of the kind of exposure that has been taken place through special purpose vehicles and other instruments. The RBI has also warned that there are several big infrastructure corporates 
or uh, several other corporates actually, not just infrastructure, who have taken loans, are over leveraged, then they pledge their shares and take more loans. So the, uh, you know, there is this kind of excessive amount of credit overhang in the system, especially in infrastructure. How does one resolve this problem for India? Well, I would say that the place to first start to assess the uh, credit exposure is to look at the balance sheets of all the banks. I don't know what the individual SPVs are, but uh, you know, banks in India are not allowed to lend uh, via any S SPVs. Uh, securitization is uh, hardly there in this uh, country uh, as a percent of total uh, overall lending. So whatever you see on the bank's balance sheet uh, is basically what is lent out. And there, if you look at uh, you know, a lot of the infrastructure lending has been done by the state-run banks. Um, and there, if you see some of the big players, uh, whether it's State Bank or others, you can, you can get a sense of the overall uh, picture of how much exposure they have to the, to the infrastructure sector. Mm. Uh, a lot of that exposure is to actually quasi-government or government-owned entities. Mm. Um, if you actually break down what the aggregate problem is in terms of lending to the uh, private sector companies that are over-leveraged over there, uh, and where projects haven't taken off because of uh, lack of raw material availability or clearances or anything like that, I don't think it's, a, it's any sort of a systemic uh, issue. Uh, we think that, for example, lending into the power sector, which has been one of the big areas of bottleneck, where uh, uh, projects have, uh, have, been, have been stuck, and if you look at the private sector, non-functioning projects, which is the key area of, of problem, uh, it's uh, probably about one and a half percent of the entire credit credit book. Uh, and if you look at the banking system ROA in India, it's about 1.3, 1.4 percent. So you're talking about, you know, if you look at the system in aggregate, mm. about one year's of profit that mm. that's that's gone out there. Mm. Uh, of course, it's 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 a problem. And for some uh, low, uh, some banks, it's a much bigger problem. They need to be recapitalized. We all know that some of these state-run banks uh, need to be re recapitalized. But if you look at the system as a whole. Uh, I don't think there is any serious concern of uh, excessive uh, leverage for the banking sector. Uh, and I think it becomes even better when the eco economic growth is uh, sort of get, you know, trending upwards. All right, so you don't seem to share the RBI's worries right now. No, I think there is always concern, there is always mm. worry with uh, what is there that we don't know. Mm. Uh, and I think the mm. RBI also uh, will, will always be on, on the more cautious side. But I think if, to, if you look at the numbers, that some of the numbers that you're pointing out, mm. they are in aggregate. Mm. 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 Uh, you know, we, we don't expect that you know, there will be any defaults from operational plants today. Mm. We don't expect that there will be any serious defaults from the government-owned companies that have taken money. Mm. Uh, so you know, those are some of the assumptions that are there behind it. Uh, but I, I think uh, the RBI governor also a few months ago made a, made a co comment saying that there is certainly concern on this, but there is no worry on a systemic basis, and I think that's right. Mm. But, uh, you know, you were saying that uh, the large part of that exposure is to government concerns. Now, if, those, uh, if I look at the power project sector, for instance, there's a huge amount of capacity which is in place, huge of amount of capacity which is supposed to come into place, but uh, much of that is actually stalled because of either a uh, lack of a PPA, a power purchase agreement with a, uh, any uh, you know, state electricity board. And therefore, there is no FSA, no fuel supply agreement either. Because if you don't show that, Coal India is not going to give you the fuel. Now, uh, when you look at a state electricity board, they don't want to buy the power at the rates at which these private uh, power generators want to sell it because they don't have the money. Someone will have to, in some senses, finance those state electricity boards to get us out of this entire logjam. I think that was probably the right picture about nine months or a year ago. Mm. But if you've seen what's mm. happened to coal prices, mm. where, they've, where they've collapsed by over 50%, uh, you know, and, uh, and the rates they are available today, I think the economics on some of those things have changed quite dramatically. Okay. Um, so, you know, what was required probably a year ago mm. to even have sort of a low ROE type return, uh, you know, at, at those rates, those rates are now much lower uh, for, uh, for the power supplier. Certainly there is some negotiating that's left. These things are not all done. Uh, yet, uh, but you know, let's not forget the the massive fall in uh, in global coal prices. Mm. 
Well, you know the uh, notified price that uh, power purchase, you know, the FSA was on, or let's say the kind of supplies that were given, coal linkages, notified price was still about one third of the international price. It's still not fallen to that level. In fact, uh, if you look at it, the government is uh, talking about blending international and notified price to actually uh, uh, sell coal at a slightly higher price at which a loan linkage was given earlier. Yeah, no, I, I don't think we've seen the full benefits of that play out into, uh, into the whole sector. But uh, at the same time, I don't feel that uh, uh, that's, uh, that's not something that's uh, going to come. Okay. Um, you know, the other thing is, as we've seen with state electricity boards, yeah. these price hikes uh, happen in spurts. And we saw a couple of years ago, once the elect state elections got done, uh, you know, state electricity boards, you know, took up prices 30, 40 percent. So they're very steep and they're very quick. Sometimes they are along the state political uh, electrical cycle as well. Um, so, you know, I don't think that the, that, you know, there is going to be a permanent logjam where, you know, state electricity boards are unable to afford power for their states. I, I just don't think that's, that's viable. And there is going to be some sort of an economic uh, arrangement that will, that will play out. Okay, let me ask you, we were talking about effective demand, right? A lot of people are saying that to kickstart demand in the system, uh, the government will have to start spending. Uh, I think to a certain extent that is one of the reasons Mr. Jaitley wants the governor uh, of the Reserve Bank to bring interest rates down because it, if it wants to spend, it wants to borrow at a slightly lower rate, of course. Now, um, if I look at effective demand or the lack of it, and the fact that there's overcapacity in several sectors right now. Again, how does one get out of that? Uh, I'm not sure I agree with the overcapacity in several sectors to begin with. And, okay. and I also think that if you look at the economy, you know, if you look at the consumer-linked economy, uh, rural economy has been fine even throughout the last three or four years. Uh, and for whatever reasons, whether it's uh, some of the government subsidy programs or improved agricultural output or whatever you want to equate the reason to. Rural economy has done well. I think there has been a slight because of lower inflation um, that, that you're starting to see some of that. So I think consumer, the whole, the, the area is doing fine. The big issue has really been on infrastructure. Mm. And that is where we see, uh, you know, hopefully a pickup happening over the next year or two. And I think the government's going to play a, uh, an important role in that. Um, as far as overcapacity is concerned, um, you know, I, we, don't really, we don't really see that any, in any way that's across the board, uh, whether you look at, uh, you know, the auto sector, whether you look at the auto component sector, uh, whether you look at, uh, you know, some of the other big manufacturing uh, places, uh, we're not hearing of any sort of mothball plants that are, you know, all over the country. So I, I don't, really don't think that there is uh, any sort of uh, overcapacity in, in India. All right. Uh, so, essentially, for you, much of the problem that was lying in terms of bottlenecks are more or less gone, right? Then, because if capacity has already been, if capacity utilization problems are more or less out of the way, you're saying that uh, that entire over leveraging situation in the power sector is not going to be a problem because uh, uh, power purchase agreements are coming through, fuel supply should come down. Because it, this is a very heartening picture, I have to say. You're giving us a lot of confidence. There, yeah, there will be two issues out here. One is on the infrastructure side, where we haven't yet seen the pickup, which we will, I think, see over the next year or two. And the other is on the, on the consumer side, where I think operating leverage is picking up for all these sectors that we've talked about. Uh, our, our checks are that the utilization rates are much higher than, than, than you're suggesting. But as the utilization picks up from whatever level, you'll continue to see uh, the operating leverage uh, play out over the course of next year, and that's very good for corporate profits. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's how I divide the picture uh, in, in those parts. Regarding the power sector, I think the key issue to focus out there is to first realize that there is no systemic crisis in the banking sector because of the lending that's done to power. There are certainly some banks that are stressed, but I think the system as a whole is fine. And that's the, that's the important thing uh, uh, with, respect to, with respect to the power sector. And, and yeah, I do believe that you know, the state electricity boards cannot go without electricity and there will be some sort of resolution on that front. Shiv, uh, you know, we're wrapping this year out, getting into 2015. So I'm going to ask you a little bit about what you think the market will do uh, in 2015. I mean, uh, 14, 2014 turned out to be a 30% year. 
uh, you think we'll get anywhere close to that number in 2015? Uh, it's hard to predict what you know one year will, will look, look like, but I, I don't think that you uh, will necessarily see the multiple re-rate by 20-25% as we saw this year because we started from valuation multiples that were fairly low. Mm. Um, but I do think that next year, if corporate earnings were to pick up, uh, you know, from the sort of low mid-teens range to, to the high mid-teens or 20% range, mm. um, that is some, some sort of a very reasonable expectation th uh, that could play out. Mm. Now, granted, there are a couple of things, as we talked about earlier, uh, you know, that will largely happen in the first half of the year, uh, you know, in terms of policy and, and budgets and, and some of those things that will have a bearing. Mm. Uh, on on it, but I think earnings growth as a whole, as a whole for corporate India will be better next year than it is this year. Mm. And uh, you know, uh, for our viewers, I just want to sort of highlight uh, this, the sectors that you're betting on. Uh, they're auto components, uh, low-cost housing financiers, private banks, uh, and uh, pharmaceuticals. Right? I mean, these are essentially your uh, themes right now. This is this is where you're putting your money in. Well, I'd say these are uh, these are some of the areas uh, that I that look promising from a multi-year perspective. Mm. Uh, it's not necessarily only a 2015, and and it sort of fits a a framework uh, where we where you can find opportunities uh, uh, where the businesses are quality businesses. Um, they're growing at a reasonable pace. Mm. Uh, there are some you know barriers to entry in in some of the uh, companies within these sectors. Mm. Uh, you know, we feel the growth rate here will, will continue for many, many years uh, mm. to come. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, generally the businesses are, uh, are run by good management teams. And mm. I think if you can get all of those things, uh, you know, uh, you ought to focus on, on those areas. And these few sectors that you, that you talked about, um, you know, have companies, mm. uh, high quality companies mm. uh, that fall within, fall within that bucket. Got that. Uh, Shiv, uh, thanks.